They caught up with me as soon as I left the woods. I placed my head at the disposal of my executioners, saying, Take these that you seek, and do your job well. Then three accurate blows of the sword put my head and my hands in a sack, and in a hurry headed towards Rome to present Mark Anthony with the macabre trophy. Anthony rewarded uh, them with a golden crown and 600,000 surstices. Fluvia, Anthony's wife, took my head, put it between her knees and began to spit on it between mockery and expletives. And then she tore out my tongue, which she frantically pierced afterwards with the pins of her headdress. Then Antony ordered for my head to be nailed outside in the speaker's gallery so that the entire population of Rome could see it. A people terrorized at such atrocity perpetrated against those who from that from that same platform had so many times defended their freedoms and at the same time a people now converted into simply an audience, the audience of a terrifying spectacle, who on that occasion came to see me in greater numbers than when they had come to hear me speaking about their freedom and the need to protect it. And then, as now, the spectacle prevails. Those were um, words dramatized, obviously, uh, but based on historical accuracy about the death of Cicero. And I'm going to tell you why, although I have done uh, the previous video on Cicero and his um, discourse, his speech against one of the traitors of Rome, Catiline. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to continue today with a little bit more about him. The, uh, this dramatization, as it were, um, the ancient sources actually tell us that that is practically, yes, what happened. He was trying to flee from one of his uh, states. Uh, he wanted to reach a port and then get on a ship and uh, leave Italy. He did not make it. He did not arrive. He was found by Mark Anthony's henchmen and they severed his head and possibly also his hands. His remains were taken to Mark Anthony to demonstrate that Cicero's execution had actually taken place. And uh, his head and his hands were put on display in the speaker's stand that for centuries had occupied space in the Roman uh, Forum. At this time, the stand was at the western end of the forum. Uh, it had been moved there by one of also uh, the people who Cicero saw as a tyrant, Caesar, Julius Caesar, and now he saw Mark Anthony as his heir. Mark Anthony's revenge obviously made him happy, undoubtedly. But if we look at the whole thing from a historical perspective, I think that perhaps Cicero ultimately triumphed over his this particular foe at any rate. And others, Catiline, Piso, Mark Antony, because 
he got at the end what he wanted from the beginning to pass on to posterity as a great orator, a philosopher, an intellectual, perhaps one of the most influential intellectuals uh, to this day in the history of humanity. Why am I talking again about Cicero? Let me get my notes here. Although I started with that dramatic intro, it's because, first of all, he was not, I, do, I don't want to uh, imply in any sense that he was a perfect gentleman, he was a saint or anything else like that. He was mainly a politician. And so he could will and deal and do his things and so on. So he was a politician, but he always defended the freedom of the people of Rome. He saw tyranny coming and he was always on the side of freedom. Now we would say freedom of speech or freedom of whatever, just, just freedom. So whatever his, um, you know, faults as a human being, uh, he was vain. He had the great power of eloquence and he knew it and so on. So he had his faults. But nevertheless, he was always on the side of against tyranny and for freedom. So I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about him because something happened here in England, and I consider it important in this in this uh, way. Uh, George Galloway has been elected to Parliament. Now, many of, of you will be very happy about it. Some of uh, many of you will not be happy about it. Some of you will not care about it, and some of you may never have heard of it, of him. But he is, will you agree, he is a good orator, a good speaker. And I think that what is going to happen in Parliament is that things are going to change. First of all, he can debate without looking at notes, because at the, at the moment we find that in our Parliament, our politicians can no longer debate a point. Some of them actually have to read what they're going to say. And sometimes we wonder, where are the Churchills and people who could speak and debate and try to persuade you? Uh, we don't find them. So this is an opportunity, as he says, fasten your seatbelts <laughs> in his podcasts. Um, where he is going to speak truth as he sees it. I know that many of you will not agree with him, obviously, but that is, he's a politician. But he is going to, what I find if in, in him is that, like Cicero, a great orator, and like Cicero, he is not afraid to speak, we we sense a lot of fear in politicians, not willing, not able to sometimes even speak and talk about what they really believe out of fear for repercussions, whatever those may be. That is not George Galloway. He's going to stand there and say what he believes in and what he has to say. And I think Parliament from now on is going to change. And that is why with this news that he has been elected, I thought of going back to Cicero, the greatest orator of the Roman Empire and from whom many even today should learn and tell you a little bit more about him. Now, hold on. 
he is known mainly for his eloquence. And he said, um, after deep reflection and long analysis, uh, these have led me to conclude that wisdom without eloquence is of little use to nations. But eloquence without wisdom is almost always harmful and it is never useful. Whoever arms himself with eloquence to defend the interests of his country will be a loyal citizen and a useful man, both for his own interest and for the public interest as well. The speaker, first of all, has to find what he has to say then distribute and place what he finds accordingly, not only with order, but with a certain rhythm and prudence, and finally to dress and adorn the speech. After that, strengthen it with memory, and finally execute it with decorum and grace. And the speaker must not only be instructed in dialectic debates, but must also have knowledge and practice of all the topics of philosophy, because without this knowledge, he will not be able to speak or explain in depth, breadth and abundance anything about questions of philosophy, anything about religion, uh, nothing about death, nothing about good and evil, nothing about virtue and vice. I intend that the speaker has, uh, on the subject uh, on which he is going to speak, knowledge worthy of cultured ears before thinking with what words or in what way he will say it. I even claim that to be great and in a certain way even sublime, he must know physics. And if he is to know the things of heaven, I do not want him to ignore things of earth and of men, such as civil law, the laws, the matter that people need to hear in the forum every day. Now, he was a politician, he was also a philosopher, not one of the greatest uh, philosophers uh, at all, he never uh, founded this school, but he, he, was, he, he dealt with things that philosophy dealt with at the time. How to, live, uh, how to live the good life, for example. He wrote on many subjects, death, friendship, all kinds of things. He wrote many uh, uh, books and treatises on, on, on rhetoric and, and philosophy, on the history of eloquence, uh, how to improve one's eloquence. Now, Karl Marx, in a rather acerbic comment, actually said, philosophy, Cicero, philosophy, no. He said, uh, Cicero knew as much philosophy as the President of the United States knows about democracy. <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is Karl Marx, okay. But uh, it is true that we cannot speak of him as an original philosopher, but that does not mean that he had no merit. He did, after all, also translate and transcribe uh, the great works in, of, uh, <coughs> of Greek literature into Latin so as to make them more accessible for everybody. Um, um, for example, on let's say death and immortality, um, he would say, uh, he said something like, like this, the entire life of philosophers, as Plato says, is a preparation for death. 
Nonetheless, separating the soul from the body is nothing other than learning how to die. For this reason, let us prepare and separate ourselves from the body, that is to say, let us accustom ourselves to dying. This conduct during the time we are here on earth will be similar to the celestial life and when we free, when we get freed from these chains here below, we take flight upwards. This grace in, of our souls will be therefore less delayed. Only when we have arrived up there and not before will we be able to say that we live. Because no one would expose himself to death for his country if he had no hope of achieving immortality. And because of this, we must, we must reach the conclusion, therefore, that death, which threatens us every day due to the uncertainty of what may happen, and that due to the brevity of life, it can never be too far away, this does not prevent the wise man from taking care of the state and his loved ones. At all times, because he at all times because he he thinks that posterity, even though he might not be aware of it, is something that really concerns him. Never is life too brief for he who has fully uh, fulfilled the duty of perfect virtue. Perfect virtue for Cicero is public service. Getting involved in public service to improve, to better the community, that was his wish. And as we've seen, the, the desire thereby for him to achieve posterity, to, to go down in history, to have a place in history. When later he finishes off the Catalan coup, uh, the coup attempt that I dealt with in another video, his conspiracy against Rome, he speaks to the people. The greatest reward I want from you, he tells them, is to remember me, to make me go down in history. And that was for him immortality, what he meant by it. In, so he was a little bit of a philosopher. Yeah, well, in, in, in politics, in ideology, he was probably on the right in that he, or perhaps a libertarian in some issues, not in others, he very much defended private property, the private property of the individuals. And he speaks, uh, he writes on duties and obligations. When he speaks of the obligations of the citizen. Now, some translators have translated this word duties, what he says as duties and others as obligations. And the difference is that the term obligation carries with it, they think, a sort of a moral thing to it, a moral obligation, whereas a duty can be applied in many circumstances, not necessarily to do with anything about morality. For example, um, my duty could be tomorrow to do this and this and this and this. In other words, a list of what my tasks, what I have to do. Obligation, they, this is not my, my contention, but I agree with it. Obligation, as he saw it, meant a moral obligation of the citizen to participate in what is happening in his country not just to sit around and wait for others to, to carry the, the heavy load. The obligation for him is moral, to defend your country. 
Uh, he 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 talks about property a lot, of private property. Uh, we uh, in this he's obviously um, although I mentioned George Galloway, uh, they would perhaps differ on this. Uh, Cicero was not um, a socialist at all, but um, the. Um, we must defend private property, he said, um, as opposed to the distribution of poverty. He did of property. He didn't agree with that at all, and explains why. Um, Whosoever is at the head of the republic must take care, above all, that each person preserves their own property and that the actions of the state uh, do not take, uh, do not diminish the property of a private citizen, because cities and uh, were created precisely. People come together precisely in order to preserve. Um, one of the things preserve their their property. Um, those who seek popularity resort to uh, agrarian reforms um, to throw the owners of their lands uh, out of their property, thereby destroying the foundations of the state. First and foremost, in a state, we need concord which cannot exist when one's property is taken away from one to give it to another. And then justice, which disappears if each one cannot possess what belongs to him. What equality is this, he asks, uh, from, uh, that from someone who has owned a plot of land or a field for many years and perhaps centuries in his family. It is taken away from him so that it becomes the property of someone who has never owned anything. It is also necessary, he continues, to prevent citizens from paying too much taxes to the state something that in the time of our ancestors happened frequently due to the poverty of the treasury and the numerous wars. But those who, if you have, the state has to take it, those who administer the country must take precautions so that there is abundance of all that's necessary for life. If a need falls on a country, all efforts will have to be made in which everyone understands, understands that if they want to be saved, they will have to give in to necessity. But to those who govern, I say, take great interest in removing even the smallest suspicion of greed on your part, because there is no more repugnant vice than avarice. Holding a public office to enrich oneself is not only shameful, but also impious. Against the motherland, sacrilegious against the gods, those who govern the state have no better means to easily win the benevolence and good opinion of the multitude than moderation and lack of self-interest. Furthermore, they are obliged in times of war and in times of peace to grow the republic in power in their lands, in their tributes. Those who fulfill this type of duties achieve, together with the utmost interest of the Republic, great esteem and glory for themselves. In eloquence and oratory, um, in Republican Rome, in which he was so successful, in Republican Rome, there were three areas where it was possible to put eloquence into practice. The courts, the senate, and the popular assembly. 
Now, the courts, they were permanent in that they were specialized courts. Each of them dealt with a specific crime, some with murder, others with embezzlement, illegal actions in the provinces, etc. At the head of each of these tribunals, uh, courts, there was a, what they call a praetor. The post was an uh, annual one, and each year, in turn, a certain of a number of sworn jurors uh, took place who could actually not belong to any class, but only to the uh, members of the aristocracy. The trials took place in public, and any person could attend, perhaps not in great numbers, but uh, take into account, uh, but, but uh, the, the speeches, um, even though there was an audience there, the speeches were not addressed to the public, but to the actual jurors themselves, which were the ones who had to decide. Uh, it was like a, a, a competition, a debate competition, really. Um, the prosecutors spoke um, obviously against the, uh, the, the the criminal, the prisoner, the inmate, while the lawyers, defense attorneys, argued in favor of the accused. In that confrontation, the jury decided um, and what counted specifically and uh, to, a, to a very large extent was actually the expertise of the speaker, um, what, uh, how great uh, an orator as it were, as it was, as it were, uh, um, was. Um, Caesar, for the most, uh, for the most part, was a defense attorney. Um, and uh, he many times uh, defended guilty people, and he knew they were guilty. Uh, but nevertheless, because his job was to defend him, he was very good at um, muddying the waters, as it were, enough so that the jury might have doubts. Uh, and finally, perhaps, because of those doubts, uh, achieve the, uh, the uh, acquittal of the, uh, of the prisoner, which is something that we see today, too. Yes. And those were the courts. The Senate was a closed area, and it met in the Curia, um, a word that we have uh, the same as the Supreme uh, Pontiff. We in the Catholic Church we we inherited the word Curia. Uh, it was the usual meeting place, or in. Uh, they could also meet in um, one of the many temples. Um, only senators could attend or speak there. And not all senators could actually speak. It was very much, you could only speak in a hierarchical order. So who, the people who ended up speaking were usually uh, former um, praetors and, and uh, magistrates and, and, and so on. And, of course, they concluded with a vote uh, and uh, by which a, a decree was, was approved or not. Um, the popular assemblies were of two types. One was uh, just a, a decision-making uh, meeting where the senators voted but did not speak. They never spoke there. They voted on a bill or elected the magistrates for the following year. And in the other, in the other assembly, they never voted. They were not decision-making assemblies, but uh, you could talk all you want. <laughs> but there you could talk, okay, before the people. Whoever wanted to attend that assembly, um, you could. And... Um, it was usually it dependent. It depended on the fame and the popularity and the notoriety of the speaker, how many people attended. 
and Cicero participated in the three, the courts, the senate and the assembly. Um, the assembly uh, to the people directly the least number of times. Uh, one of his, uh, well, he has so many famous speeches, but um, as I said, I, I, I read rather badly one on, um, on uh, against Catiline, the conspirator. There is another one against Piso. Um, Piso was, um, just to give you a sort of a brief summary, um, Piso was one of the consuls in the year 58, um, the year in which Cicero was forced to go into exile for almost one and a half years. Uh, it was a, a horrible time in his life. He blamed directly or indirectly uh, the uh, consuls, but uh, especially Piso, for not having done anything, for not having prevented it. He felt that they could have done. Piso, besides, uh, belonged to the Calpurnio family, which was one of the great aristocratic families at the time. Um, his family, uh, true blue blood aristocratic, had statues uh, all over uh, Rome, you know, of his forefathers, his ancestors. Cicero, on the other hand, was what was called the a new man, um, new money, a sort of an upstart. He was from humble beginnings, not necessarily very, very humble right, at, the, at the bottom of everything, but he was in a provincial way quite well off, but nowhere near the aristocracy. And so Piso made it clear how much he disdained this upstart and that Cicero did not, <laughs> did not like that very much, as you can imagine. And with the power of his eloquence, uh, he, he went for him. Uh, he, he, you know, he, Piso really touched a uh, uh, nerve there. Um, because he's, he wants to tell him, and he does tell him, that he is there where he is through his own merits. And he's therefore going to accuse him a bit of him, of Piso, being a nobody. Why? Because he himself did not achieve a thing. He was dependent on his family, um, his ancestors. Um, let me look at my notes here. Well, yeah, I have a little fragment here of what he says to Piso. Don't you realize, you monster? <laughs> Don't you understand that people complain about you, they even complain about your physical appearance. Few of us were aware of these muddy, muddy vices of yours. Few of your intellectual incapacity, your clumsiness and your weakness of expression. Never had your voice been heard in the forum Never did a real danger tested your decision-making skills. No act, no illustrious, but n not, not illustrious action, but not even known in war or in peace. And you, Paiso, you boast before me of having obtained all the magistrate offices without ever being defeated? I, I can proclaim this about myself and with true pride. Because when you were appointed quaestor, 
even those who had never seen you nevertheless granted you this honor. They granted it actually to you because of your family name. The Roman people appointed Wang Paiso, not this Paiso. Likewise, it was to your ancestors that the praetorship was granted. Your ancestors dead but known, but you alive, no one knows you. When the Roman people appointed me quester, among the first candidates, they granted the honor to my person, not to my family, not to my customs or hereditary, not to any of my ancestors, but to my proven efficacy, not to a nobility known by hearsay. And what am I going to say? Consulship, the, about the consulship, how I obtained it or how I managed it. All of Italy elected me, my person. And by acclamation even before election. But <laughs> how foolish of me. Am I now really comparing myself to this ruin of a man, this scourge, this abject, despised, abandoned by all, desperate and hopeless, looking with restlessness all around, fearful in case someone is going to rebuke you, distrusting your own affairs without a voice, without freedom, without authority, without any dignity, terrified, trembling, flattering everyone. Like the, uh, I have, like those, oh yes, like those I have wanted to see you, like that I am, I have seen you, like that I am seeing you now. If it takes long to do it for justice to be done, at least I shall enjoy your unworthiness and I will not be less happy to see you always despised than if I saw you for one moment in a convict's attire. Now, he could use invective. <laughs> it is a furious attack, actually, against a, a, a political adversary. But of course, the most famous ones are against Catiline. Um, he was, if you remember, he was able to find out about the rumor and then confirm it that sure enough, there was a plot, a conspiracy and the way to seize power surreptitiously, disregarding the institutions and of the state and the leader was Catiline. And he gave several speeches in the Senate and before the people in which he portrayed uh, Catiline in the most abject way possible, <coughs> looking for him to be, let me see, uh, looking for him to be declared a public enemy by the Senate and looking for the people to distance themselves from any possibility of supporting this conspiracy. Um, the first uh, Catiline speech uh, against Catiline was in the Senate. And his objective is to show the perverse face of Catiline so that the Senate has nothing to do with him. And there is a very famous painting by Cesare Macari uh, depicting um, 
um, Cicero in the center, in the Senate, and uh, all the senators there listening to him, and Catiline there in a the corner. No one wants to sit even near him. Um, he managed to isolate him so that his uh, forthcoming plot will not succeed. Another fragment. Until when, Catiline, will you continue to abuse our patience? How much longer this madness of yours will continue to mock us? At what point will you boasting uh, will you go on boasting your unbridled audacity? Have the nightly guards of the Palatine, have the patrols in the streets, have the fears of the people, have the gatherings of all loyal citizens, have the, these st uh, strongly defended, uh, defended premises in which this meeting is being held right now, have the uh, Fall, the faces and the expressions of the senators here had all these not had any effect on you at all? Do you not realize that all your machinations have been discovered and exposed? Do you not see that your conspiracy has no way out? What times we are living, though? What way of doing things? The Senate knows everything and the Consul is watching it. Nevertheless, this individual lives. Alive, did I say? Not only alive, he even makes an appearance in the Senate. And he points with his eyes, with his very own eyes, he hopes to death, the death of each one of us. He has agreed long ago that by order of the consul they would lead you, all of you, all of us, to our deaths. You, Catiline, ought long ago to have been taken to your death and to have the misfortune to fall on you the destruction the destruction that you have long been plotting against us by hercules if my slaves feared me as your fellow citizens fear you you do not think that you should leave the city and if i had become the target of the suspicious suspicions uh, of my fellow citizens and become so hateful to them I would prefer to avoid, avoid being in their presence rather than being looked upon with hostile, hostile eyes by everyone. And if your own parents feared and hated you and you could in no way appease them, you would retire, I think, to some place far away from, this, from their sight. Now it is the patria, the homeland, the motherland, to all of us, the one that hates you and fear you, and the one that judges that you have not thought for a long time, but to the only thing, the only thought you have had is to put her to death. Will you not respect her authority? Will you not abide and defer to her judgment? Will you not fear her power? That's in the Senate, when he's speaking to the people, the speeches are shorter, different, not perhaps so technical, but more emotional, obviously. You have to rouse the masses. He wanted the people to understand the situation. He wanted to, to a certain extent, worry them um, in order to rouse them. He tells the Plebeian, that the city would be on fire, literal or figuratively. So, let me find another. 
Yes, another another fragment. But uh, yes, uh, Catalan at the end uh, left Rome, but uh, he would still manage to recruit an army in what is uh, in Tuscany today. Yeah, and uh, for a few more months yet, the Roman legions will have to face Catalan with uh, until he's finally defeated so he did try to go for a for a coup he he will he will die in in one of those battles cicero will remain in rome and will be declared the father of the nation the pater patri but also to this triumph uh, over catalin will follow a great problem of it throughout his life uh, and uh, we will uh, uh, and uh, he will uh, finally be condemned really for having executed some of the Catalan's followers without a prior trial although the senate had agreed to it and the people had uh, also um, expressed their approval so for him the the, the, uh, the what was on the on the one hand uh a moment of true glory um, was also, and for a long time, uh, caused him a great deal of frustration. The last one of uh, Caesar's uh, oratorial uh, history was the one that he waged against Mark Anthony in the final days of his life. He had retired from public life, but um, um, that was during the, the mandate of Julius Caesar. And after Caesar's assassination, he um, doubted whether he should return to public life or not. Uh, he remained uh, mainly in his, uh, in his uh, country house, away from the Senate, until he realized that although the tyrant in his eyes had been assassinated, tyranny had not ended because Mark Antony was to be Cicero's successor. And this was the, uh, this was the risk that uh, he would, uh, there was a risk that he would reproduce the same system of government. Uh, he was embarked on a ship to flee from Italy and when he found out about Mark Anthony probably at the time becoming the successor. He returned, returned to Rome, actually to face him and to fight, as he saw it, against tyranny and began a real political campaign against Mark Anthony through what we now call um, his speeches are called the Philippics. They are political speeches given by Cicero to the Senate, some of them to the people, uh, uh, as, as he had done with the Catalan case. As usual, he is to, he's good as at brutalizing the enemy, as it were. Mark Anthony in this case, to present him as a uh, person full of vices, as a public enemy to Rome, and consequently as someone who had to be um, eliminated from public life. And I want to share with you two fragments of uh, the Philip Philippics, um, uh, third and, and fourth giving on the same day, one in the Senate and the other one in the Forum to the people. And the one in the Senate, he says, uh, Today, for the first time in a very long time, I'm able to set foot in the home of freedom, of which I was not only a defender as far as I was able to, but also its protector. Since who could 
put up with this horrible monster. What is there in Antony except lust, cruelty, insolence, rudeness, audacity? All of him seems to be a conglomerate of these vices. We cannot find in him even a trace of nobility, moderation, discretion, or shame. So, since the situation has reached the point of having to decide, of us having to decide whether he will wash away his guilt towards the Republic, or on the other hand, we will become slaves that is the choice, the courage and virtue of our ancestors to, he recalls, the courage and virtue of our ancestors, uh, of our forefathers to either recover the freedom proper of the name and the people of Rome or death before slavery. That is the confrontation now. You either fight it or you lose your freedoms with, with a tyrant. He continues, we have endured many things that should not have been endured in a free country. And we have tolerated them. Some of us perhaps in the hope of recovering our freedom at some point. Others have supported it because of an excessive desire to go on living, to protect themselves. But shall we also endure the horrible and most cruel domination of this repugnant evildoer? What will he not dare to do if he wins? This person who, without having achieved any victory, has carried out such great crimes after Caesar's death. This person who has subordinated his actions to just plunder and profit and has tried to come to Rome with an army speaking, the end, speaking of the end and the destruction of the city. I will support with my opinion, and as I understand it, it is not against your will, all the measures so that not only do we grant authority to the most outstanding generals and hope of rewards for the bravest soldiers to put an end to this. Okay. Then the, uh, the, uh, to the people, the speech that he gave to the people is much shorter and actually a little bit of uh, trickery here because he made them to understand that the Senate had already approved uh, Mark Antony being a, um, a public enemy, an enemy of Rome. Well, um, not quite. Uh, um, never actually got that far, but he simplified his message, saying that it is now freedom that is up for grabs. It depends on you. These are our enemies. Your incredible assistance, citizens, and this crowded assembly, as I don't remember before, awaking in me the, max, the maximum enthusiasm to defend the Republic and moreover the hope of recovering it. Indeed, today, citizens, we have laid, up the, uh, laid down the foundations of uh, future actions. Mark Antony has not yet been explicitly declared enemy of the homeland by the Senate, but in fact it has already been considered as such. You are fighting against an enemy such that it is not possible to pact with him to 
any conditions of peace you are not dealing with the uh, with the ruthless and abominable creature but with a monstrous and horrid beast this enemy of yours attacks your republic tries to destroy the senate exhausted your treasury what relationship can there be between peace and a man who is characterized by incredible cruelty and a total absence of loyalty therefore citizens the roman people winner over all peoples fights against the murderer a common bandit preserve citizens i beg you this virtue freedom that was left to you as an inheritance by your elders before you for the sake of freedom they first subdued all of italy then they destroyed carthage they they devastated numantia and submitted to our dominion the most powerful kings and the most warlike peoples the moment has arrived citizens much later uh, than much later than this would have been best for the republic but don't understand this much later than would have been left much later than would have been best for the republic but so prescient that it can no longer be delayed for even an hour it is sacrilege that the roman people whom the immortal gods wanted to rule over other peoples be slaves themselves the situation has reached a crucial point we fight for freedom it is vital citizens either to win something that you will surely achieve or anything better than being slaves other peoples may be capable of enduring slavery but the attribute of being a roman is liberty okay uh he did fail despite this he failed uh lost that fight for his republic as he saw it he failed because those he had always called tyrants the ones who had assassinated caesar never actually had the actual strength or know-how to aspire to power because the followers of caesar were disunited started fighting amongst themselves but finally uh, in uh, they ended up uh, sort of coming together um uh, and creating an alliance in the year 43 a tribune from the people a representative promulgated a law which would be approved um and that law was that uh, a triumvirate would be in power three people which was sort of odd but it was kind of legal and official and uh, that uh, triumvirate would be above the uh, the magist uh, the uh, the above uh, all other the consulates for example the three people one was uh, lepidius who was not didn't really play a part he was a minor figure and he was practically ignored and the other two great leaders uh, for the following years were one was mark antony and the other one was called octavian uh, the future augustus who was caesar's adoptive son and uh, he was going to hold power for a long 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 time and this triumvirate meant death for cicero one of the first measures taken by the three was to issue a list of outlaws as it were a death list uh, they were now called the enemies of rome officially although in reality they were not really enemies of rome they were enemies of those in power in rome 
And among one of the first ones in this list was Cicero, um, who had become such an enemy uh, to be defeated, uh, as far as Mark Anthony was concerned. And so that is how I started the video, if I may uh, read it again about his death, dramatized as if Cicero was uh, seeing, watching his own death. They caught up with me as soon as I left for the woods. I placed my head at the disposal of my executioner, saying, take this that you seek and do your job well. And then three accurate blows of the sword put my head and my hands in a sack and in a hurry headed towards Rome to present Mark Antony with the macabre trophy. Antony rewarded them with a golden crown and 600,000 surstices. Fluvia, Antony's wife, took my head, put it between her knees and began to spit on it between mockery and expletives. Then she tore out my tongue, which she frantically pierced with the pins of her headdress. Then Antony ordered for my head to be nailed outside in the speaker's gallery so that the entire population of Rome could see it, a people terrorized at such atrocity perpetrated against those who from that same platform had so many times defended their freedoms and at the same time a people converted now into an audience, an audience of a terrifying spectacle who on that occasion came to see me in greater numbers than when they had come to hear me when I spoke of freedom. And then as now spectacle prevails. Okay, so that is uh, Cicero. He had his faults. He spoke about what he considered the freedom of the people of Rome. And, um, well, he ended up perhaps Perhaps what he wanted, which was immortality and posterity. So I leave you here and uh, make your own conclusions. Bye bye.